Welcome to Paranormal Yakko. You are invited to join me, your host, Stan Mallow, each week when I interview a different guest of note in their respective field. The unexplained, the mysterious, the macabre, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena. We explore them all on Paranormal Yakker. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. My guest in today's show is Dr. Arlen Andrews Sr. He is a widely published author, is a retired professional engineer who worked at the White House Science Office in White Sands Missile Range and co founded several high tech startups. He is is founder and director of Sigma, the science fiction think tank, which consults with the U.S. government on futurism topics. Dr. Andrews has also traveled the world in his study of ancient civilizations and technologies, Kia Rumiak, Peru being one of them. Now, having said that, what I just said is a perfect segue to what I'll be talking to Dr. Andrews about. That's his book, Kia Rumiak, Lost Secrets of the Shadow machine and ancient enigma of Peru revealed. Dr. Arlen Andrew Senior, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. Thank you, Stan. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much paranormal about this. This is a book that you referenced. It's on Amazon. All the intricate details of what I'll talk about tonight are in that book. Kia Rumiak in Peru has been an enigma for centuries. You, Arlen, have solved this ancient Andes mystery and give the results in your book. What exactly is Kia Rumiak? What was it used for? And how did you hear about it? I compliment you on pronouncing it right. <laughs> it's difficult. Nobody does at first, not even me. Kia Rumiak. Kia means moon. Rumi is rock and yak means belonging to. So it's the rock that belongs to the moon or the moon rock. That's what the recent indigenous people have called it. They think that it's to do with the moon because of the shape of it, maybe the shape of a crescent moon. But my own studies think, I believe, that it's only a solar calendar. I was in the sacred Valley of Peru back in 2012, going to visit another rock, which is called Sewaiti Stone. That's something different, another show. And we came across this crude sign that pointed to an unusual looking sculpture. So the next day we drove by it. What I saw that first day, I'll show you some pictures, was this. Here's a sculpture in a piece of limestone. It's about eight and a half feet wide. It's about three feet high and two feet deep. So it's not very big. To me, it was beautiful. And so I sat there for a couple of hours on a convenient stone, looked at it, watched the shadows move around. And because it has a parabola in the middle of it, I said, this has got to be a solar calendar because all solar calendars are basically are parabolic. But this one did not have a pointer in it. Didn't have a, a rod that sticks up and does a shadow. That's unusual. I was very intrigued by it and took a lot of pictures and did a few measurements. And that evening, we went back to the hotel in Cusco. I got online and I started looking up for all the details I could find. I said, surely there's got to be fantastic picture books about this, you know, coffee table picture books. But no, all I could find online was this government pamphlet that said, here we have it. It's there. Nobody knows what it's for. Nobody knows who made it. It has to, something to do with the worship of the moon and it's a feminine sculpture or feminine idol. That was all. I said, now, I can't accept that. I'm an engineer. Brian Forrester was the fellow who took us there to start with. He's a well-known guide in Peru. He's got the hidden Inca channel. And if you look up one of his programs there, you'll see the day that we discovered it back in 2012. Hidden Inca channel. Uh, I think, did the Inca have a clock? That was the name of it. I said, this has got to be a solar calendar and this parabola doesn't exist and any other new world architecture anywhere else. The uh, parabola and arches and things like that only exist in the old world. To me, I was intrigued. I hired Brian to go back half a dozen times and take hundreds of measurements for me so I could make a 3D computer-aided design model, 3D CAD model. Once I had that model, then I could place it in the proper coordinates that we measured. I could rotate it around. If you use NOAA, the uh, government site, it shows you where the sun is at any given moment for the last 2,000 years. And so I used that and I played with it. And I came up with with a crude model, only an approximate model, looked about like this. I played with that model and made predictions about where the shadows would be at the rest of the year. And Brian went out there and took photographs and proved it was right. Crude models, approximate models. I didn't know exactly how it was oriented, but it came out right. So this, this proves it right there. So now all I need to do is go more details and find out if it does anything else. It looked like it showed where the solstices 
equinoxes were beginning and end of the, of the year, and it showed where the equinoxes were the other part of the year. So you had the four seasons marked on it. I said, well, if it marks four seasons, perhaps it does other things. So I did a lot of studying on it. If you look at the outline of the area, you see the sculpture itself, and you'll see a thing I call the shaman stone. That's a stone 25 feet east of it where I sat and did the observations. And you'll see there's not in any area for any big crowd to gather around. And the stone I was sitting on was only big enough for one or two people. So I I said this must be a uh, solar calendar that's only observed by one or two, just a few people. It's not for big ceremonies or anything else. It's uh, it's there. Downstream of that area, there are the ruins, megalithic ruins of a building. So in the past, there must have been a structure there. People lived in it. And one of their priests, or they call him a Yanka in Inca, Yanka would go up there and look at it and say, okay, this is beginning of the season so-and-so. This is beginning of the season so-and-so. And by the approximate model I had, I could tell all these things. 2012, I posted a lot of pictures of this on YouTube. And naturally, all the what I call wing nuts come out. Oh, this had to be melted in there. Aliens had to do it with a laser. No, I was there. I spent many hours on it. Brian took hundreds of pictures. If you go up to it, you can tell thousands of chip marks, either with chisels or chipping stones or something. The only parts of it that were beautifully done was the internal arc. It's still sharp today. You can run your finger over it. It's sharp. And some of the front feet of it are smooth. The markings around the edge are precisely located. But if you look at them closely, they're not precisely chiseled. They're just located in the right place. And so these marks are in the periphery of it. And you can see over, over my shoulder here in the back. These marks were kind of like the marks on the clock, on an analog clock. Shadows align with those particular marks at particular times of the year and present different kinds of information. The reason I uh, reject all of these things about aliens and ancient astronauts doing this, there's nothing there that human beings couldn't have done. In fact, in my studies around the entire world with people who've done things like this all the world, like my friend Chris Dunn in the pyramids, human beings did everything. We have not found anything that needed to alien technology or lasers to do. Some of the stuff in Egypt did require high-speed machines, but that's another whole 50 YouTube presentations. But in Peru there, everything was done by hand. Now, as an engineer, I wondered... You got this big stone there, and you're carving it. How in the world did they design this thing? And so my wife, being the practical one in our marriage, she says, you know, if it's up to me, hon, I would make a uh, a mud model of it, a terracotta model. I would put it on a platform right next to the area you want to put it at. I would make a great big model and sculpt it out of clay until those shadows did exactly what I wanted to do. Then I would tell my sculptors, okay, reproduce it in that stone. It's a lot easier to change things in a mud model than it is to correct an error in stone, because in stone you can't correct it. <laughs> I think that's what they did. To me, the, the genius of it was the conceiving of it and the layout of it. And it's tilted back 45 degrees. There's not another solar calendar world that's tilted like that. And I did run hundreds of computer simulations trying to place a pole in the middle, have a pointer somewhere so it would show these things. And nothing works. So I came to the conclusion that this is unique solar calendar, as near as I can tell, in all of history, in all the world. It doesn't have a pointer in it, a gnomon. It depends only on the internal shadows that are carved in to the stone and an overhead shadow that comes down. They carved some some stones above it and the shadow comes down. Interesting th thing that I found out was at the equinox in June, several things happen to tell that's the beginning of their year. The uh, vertical shadow moves across the interior of this. It aligns with the first marker, the lines of the first marker on the, uh, on, the, on the stone arc. At the same time, a shadow comes down from overhead and touches the arc. That shadow then points to another phenomenon that I discovered. At certain times of the day and the year, there's a hole in the side that allows the sun to shine down through onto that sculpture. That's never been pointed out. In fact, nobody has ever written anything about this. In my book, I give all the details of every mention of Kiaromiak that I could find in the literature. And most of them say it's there. It might have an astronomical meaning. It's probably just a ritual, female, feminine idol of some sort. That's it. Once you say that, you can't go anywhere. Just like if you say what well, aliens did or ancient astronauts did it, you have to stop. But if you're an engineer like me and you don't accept that, you can start looking into the detail and actually finding things. And I've discovered things. I discovered the sun shines through. I discovered that my model shows the same thing. It shows that uh, the sun shining through. Another thing I discovered was that the uh, if you look at all those arcs pointing in, if you look at it from above, a plan view, they all come together in one place. If you look at it in 3D, you'll see this. They all seem to come together at one place. And to prove that, when I went back in 2017 for the next trip, I went up there and sat in there and was able to show that. Now, you're not supposed to do that. You're not allowed 
to climb over the thing. I hope I don't get in trouble with proven authorities. I don't plan ever to go back again. But uh, uh, another thing, by uh, looking at it engineering-wise, I went and uh, I measured all the art, all the directions, and found out that tip to tip, the thing tilts 13 degrees east of north. Why that is? Why does it? Why is it tilted that way? Not north and south. Well, in the book, I say like, oh, good textbooks do. I lead that as an exercise for the reader. I'm not an astronomer. I'm not an archaeologist. But I found these things. To me, the important thing is there was a genius of some sort, or maybe more than one, in some ancient Indian culture. We don't know how old this is. It has to be at least Incas, and the Incas were 500 years ago. It might be older than that. The Incas are only around about 200 years, so this could have been thousands of years old. I tried to study it by using that sun shining through that hole onto the sculpture. I could place that back 2,000 years, but that doesn't mean that's what it was. It might have meant they put it in there 600 years ago, and it was good for any time. The point is now, you can still go there today. I have been told that at least one archaeologist Archaeologists has refuted my claims. I have seen nothing in print or no communication yet, but they can't refute the shadows. You can go there on June the 21st through the 24th or so. You will see the one shadow go across the side, the one come across the top. You'll see the feet. One of the feet goes into sunlight and one goes into shade, and the sun shines through that hole where the shadow points to it. I went there, like I said, two, two different times in 2017 over that four-day uh, period, solstice, and videotaped it and took lots of pictures. So it's there. Now, one of the things that showed up, well, I was looking at lots of pictures. I was looking at a whole bunch of pictures that Brian had taken. And this is something that looked real to me. So we went back in 2017, I, I checked it. If you squint your eyes on this thing, you can see what looks like the shadow of a condor. You see the eye, the beak, crest, tail, and the feathers. During the day, right before the uh, those shadows start to come down, you see the shadow of the condor form. It looks like it alights on top of that sculpture. I saw that first in those uh, still pictures, but then we looked at looked at it in real life. <laughs> My God, it really does. Something less profound, but also this is a possibility of speculation. I identified this section of the book. In the winter solstice, or the December solstice, rather, it appears to be, I outlined it in white here, the shadow of a puma pointing in the opposite direction. Now, from what I've read about the Inca culture and other Indian cultures, the condor was a sacred bird representing the sky. The puma is a sacred animal representing representing the ground. And when you have a condor in one direction and a puma in the other direction, that's a common theme in the sacred valley, among other shadows. There are other many other shadows throughout the valley. These people knew what they were doing. These shadows have been accidental. If in America we're working on a big mountain or something and we accidentally come up with a, a Statue of Liberty, do you think that's an accident? I don't think we would do that. The, the shadows are there. The way they're interpreted is up to other people. In the book, I identify things that are concrete that are actually shadows. You can go there and see them. There's some other things that are speculation about what happens when you have cloudy days. Is there a calibration mechanism where the Yonka could back up and show where the shadow would have been? I speculate on a lot of those things and maybe even uh, showing the, the month. And perhaps if you're good enough and we had a good enough model, you could maybe even tell the day of the year. But that's not something I can do. What I would hope to do, my intent, was to interest professional archaeologists in this. Now, I talked to a few before I started everything and they weren't really not very interested. They never heard about it to start with. A few months ago, I sent a copy of the book to a real Indian archaeologist in Chicago, and he's down in Peru now. And said he hasn't checked things out. I asked him, please, to go by Key Room. I can take some photographs, if he would, so I could tweak the model better. I don't have pictures of every day and all the shadows all during the year, which I'd like to have. After that, it would be good to have some company go out and do a 3D laser scan of the whole front. That rock that's carved in is about 30 feet wide and 60 feet high. It'd be nice to have a complete laser scan of all of it, so you get a 3D laser scan. You've seen the 3D laser scans they've done of the wreck of the Titanic. You know, they have that whole thing down to a millimeter. Well, if we can do that for Kiaromiak and get the perfect model of it, then you can probably understand other things that are going on during the year. Because I imagine they built it for more than just, just the seasons. We're just getting started. My estimates are only approximate right now. But I'm just blown away by the fact that there had to be a genius of the order of Newton or Einstein to come up with this thing to start with. What was there about Kiaromiak that so attracted you to it that you wound up undertaking a number of long, arduous, and I would imagine costly trips there. The first trip was costly, but I was going to see something else. So Kia Remock was just... Uh, the second trip went down and the first trip I took with my son, the doctor, was fortunate because I, I got... Out of Waffles Revenge one night in Cusco, and my son, who's a doctor, MD, got me some antibiotics and cured me in a day. The second time I went down with my now deceased brother, 
because he wanted to see it. It was beautiful. To me, that arc in the middle of it and the whole outline, of it, it just this is an elegant thing. If I didn't know anything else about it, I thought this was elegant, but I couldn't leave it alone like that. If I had gone back to Cusco that night and found, okay, here are three or four books about it, I would have bought those books and been happy with it. I wouldn't need to, to do any research. But what I don't understand, I don't understand why it's been ignored. If you just call it a religious instrument or icon or temple or something like that, people, their minds stop. That's good enough. But I didn't think of that. I thought of it. Parabola in the middle means it's solar. And uh, I wanted to find out why. And I spent entirely too much time and money looking at it. But uh, hey, I made a claim. I want other people to look at it. What I would really like for it is this park to become a World Heritage Site. Because there's a little village close by and those people are dirt poor. It would be so nice if this became a real good tourist attraction. And that every uh, equinox, every solstice, people would come out there and pay money for the th by the thousands to look at it. Now, there is a celebration every August at that park, but it occurs on the other side of the mountain, other side of that rock. And they do a bunch of, well, I call it make-believe Inca. Nobody knows what the Inca did because Spaniards wiped all out except what they wrote about. But they, they put some thousands of people to attend something in August, but not looking at this. They'd look on the other side. There are some terrace areas where in the past they had assemblies of some sort. I'd like to see the same thing occur for this one and make it a World Heritage Site because there's nothing else like it that I can tell in the whole world. What was it like for you personally when you first visited Peru and explored its ancient mystical sites? Did you feel any special vibes or energies or it was all very methodical and up to that? No, I'm an engineer, but I'm a writer and a creative per spiritual person too. I went down to look at a thing called the, the Suede Stone. The Suede Stone is about 50 miles further on up the Sacred Valley from Cusco. It's, uh, first off, Kiriumac is 30 miles from the Cusco, and I think Kiriumac is another 50 beyond that. It's a rock that's 13 feet long, 8 feet wide, and about 8 feet high, which has hundreds of things carved into it. The first time I looked at it, I said, this looks like a hydraulic model, thinking like an engineer. Now, what I read about, there is a lot of written, written about that, but they call it a, uh, a spiritual model. Uh, the Inca use it for this, that, and the other. But I said, this is a hydraulic model, and I want to go down and test it. So I went down there to do it. And again, another channel of Brian's there did as a lost Inca city or something is the name of what he called that thing. You can see pictures of us we're pouring water in it and seeing it run down channels and things like that. I think I did discover while I was there a lost technology for real. At the bottom of the uh, Suede sculpture, there's a interlocking series of channels, finger-like things. And I took pictures of those and I wondered what those were. So I looked it up and it turns out nobody else has pointed out about Suede but me. The Paracas people who were on the other side of the Andes thousands of years before had a thriving civilization and it was desert land. And nobody ever could figure out how do they raise enough crops to feed a big population? Well, they used a system that was only rediscovered uh, like in, the, I think, the 1980s called the Waru Waru. They had, uh, imagine this in two dimensions, water would run down with the fingers here representing areas that are raised maybe eight inches to a foot. And they had water channels between them. And they would make a great big area like that, with fingers and troughs, but only so high. And what it, at night, the water would rise and form a microclimate that would be very good, conducive to producing agriculture. So they were able, to, using this system they invented, the Waru Waru, you can re look it up. They uh, came up with a way to have enough agriculture to feed a huge population. Population. Now, over the years, they died off and that uh, agricultural irrigation system was lost, but it existed over there in Suede, on the Suede stone. They showed it. You can pour water and the water runs down it and everything else. Well, it was rediscovered, I think, in the 1980s. And since they rediscovered it, they've now used it, I think, in Peru and China. And it increases crop yields amazingly in the middle of a desert because of what these ancient people had discovered, that a microclimate would evolve and uh, the water keep a moist area about a foot above this whole field. And so you look at Waru, W-A-R-U, Waru, Waru, online, and you can see pictures of it. And uh, uh, it's to me that was a lost technology in stone if somebody had looked at it before and understood it they would have known before 1980s how to use this technology so to me this is a concrete example you can't argue with of a lost technology in stone that was there in, in plain sight for anybody to see okay what else are we missing at Kiromiak? and other temples and ancient places around the world. There might be things built in that ancients didn't write about, but if we're smart enough to think like human beings and not ancient aliens and everything, we can maybe, we can learn things, what the world's about, right? It's fun. Does anyone know who the builders of Kia Rumiak were and during what period was it built? In the 1500s, there was a one Inca the Inca, the man who ran everything, the king. He said, "Let I want calendars built around the Tehuantinsuyo. That's the whole kingdom, Inca kingdom. And so they built some big towers in Cusco. There were huge towers, uh, cylinders, pillars that you could go out to and watch 
the shadows in different parts of the year. Hundreds of people, thousands of people could see when the equinox was and everything else. You have to remember the Inca were solar worshippers. People in the countryside worshipped the moon. The Inca came in and they were conquerors. You know, they were like the Russians of the old days. They just came and rolled over people and took over. And this is what you're going to worship. Unfortunately, the... Uh, the conquistadors, when they came in, they tore down all those towers. Now, I thought when I read this that the Inca said, okay, let's build calendars all over the country so people would have them. Maybe this was one of them. I said, that's great. They would, if they built one, surely they would build other ones somewhere else, right? Not that I could find. Now, if you built another Kiarumiak 50 miles away, north or south, east or west, the shadows wouldn't work. You have to use different dimensions, not greatly different, but somewhat different. But there's not another one down there. This one was unique. I imagine, like I said, this was a calendar that was, uh, well, let's put it this way. The big stones calendar pillars in Cusco, like Big Ben clock in London, thousands of people, everybody could see it. Kia Rumiak was more like the grandfather clock in your hallway. One guy looks at it and says, yep, this is the date, this is the time, this is the place. And maybe that one Yanka guy came back down and to the people living in that megalithic building, said, okay, go out and tell the people now it's time to plant or time to harvest, or maybe we're going to have a ritual for a god or something. This is what it's for. And nobody knows when it was built. The Inca, that Inca was probably like 550, 600 years ago. The aging of the unit, of the thing itself, it doesn't appear to be as old. Now you go there to Saxwayman and some of those places around Cusco, and those rocks are really, really worn. You know, the sharp corners are now worn off by erosion, and, you know, earthquakes and everything else. But Kiwi Rock, in the areas that it's meant to be sharp, there are sharp edges. And it doesn't appear like it's had many thousands of years of rain or anything else pouring down on it. 500 to 1,000 years. But like I said, the Inca were only there for 200 of those years. So the, the Waru people were there before, or the Wari, and I don't know what other cultures. This is why I'd like to have a professional archaeologist to look at these things. And they might know of other facts that said, oh, yeah, this this explains that. Or, yeah, no, no, I, know, I know what this means. You know, or, I haven't taken it on myself to study a lot of Peruvian archaeology. I was more interested in the engineering, which was a big enough problem problem for me as it was. How do the indigenous tribes of the area view Kiarumi Act? Do they understand and respect its historical significance? And how do they look upon tourists who visit it? I think they like tourists to come and spend money. <laughs> According to that government pamphlet I showed you the picture of before, the local people there call it that because they think it had to do with the worship of the moon. So that's where the name came from. But even other archaeologists who, one guy from Cuba came by and looked at it and said, well, maybe astronomical, but he said the Spaniards, conquistadors, have no record of it. There's not any record of it anywhere in the old uh, colonial records. He said there's no evidence that that was the original name of it because these people don't know who built it. I, I doubt if in that in, in mostly Catholic Peru, if you have people worshiping a pagan symbol, you know, people attribute anything they want to, to whatever they want. I'm looking into what it does, how people want to take that and use it for something else. You know, we have Stonehenge, which I've been with that too. And my friend Gerald Hawkins said it was a computer, ancient computer for, uh, uh, for astronomical events. Other people say, oh, it's holy stuff and everything else. But it's interesting. One of the things that's interesting to me about this project when I was on it, and I could be wrong, I've never read of another person, another project taking an ancient monument like I've done here, making a 3D CAD model of it, and then studying the model itself rather than being at the site and doing something. If I could be at the site every day for a year, I would have much rather done that, but it was not practical, probably not safe. I needed a way to study it, so I said, well, I want, first off, I wanted to get enough information to build myself a 3D model, a physical clay model, maybe a life-size model. But then it does me, why do that? If I have a CAD model, I can make it any size I want. I can rotate it around. I can bring down rain. I can bring in shadows and sunlight. I can do anything I want to with it. It would be nice to have a trail cam out there to photograph this during the daylight hours for an entire year. It would be nice, even better, to have that three-dimensional scan of the whole front so we could have a 3D model that we give to everybody in the world to play with and see if, what else you can come up with. There are numerous ancient structures on the site. One of them is a cave with intriguing megalithic structures in it. Would you, Arlen, know the meaning, the purpose of those structures and the reason they would built inside the cave instead of on the outside grounds. That cave, my son, Dr. Sean Andrews and Brian Forster went in that cave and other people have done archaeological studies in that cave showing to me what looked like crude primitive caveman drawings and stuff. I can't imagine that the people who lived in that cave and did that kind of stuff had anything to do with the elegance of Kiromiak or the megalithic structures below. Now, I didn't read anything about megalithic structures inside a cave, so I can't comment on that. The first day we were there for half a day, I spent all my 
my time on that rock looking at shadows and taking some a few measurements. The second time I went, I just wanted to get all the details of the rock. I didn't wasn't interested in the caveman drawings and that stuff. I didn't go to, to the rest of the site. It might be related. That's why we need people who can spend a lot of time there. And there's probably a PhD theses in here. What are some of the other sites in the area that impressed you? There's a, a big one called Oyante Tambo. Again, it's, everything is within 50 miles of each other. And that's a place with huge terraces that are built up a hill. And at the top of that place, in 2012, I was able to run it right up at no problem at all. I went back in 2017 with my brother. I couldn't quite hack it. And also, there was no reason to. But the first time, there are some huge stones at the top. And they call it the Temple of the Sun. And there are stones up there that must weigh 100 tons. And they were quarried in a mountain several miles away across a river. So they had to bring those things down across the river and back up and then place them and place four of them across the top. And there was one halfway up the road coming from the river that they stopped. They call it the tired stone. I guess people, for some reason, got tired of dragging it and uh, just left it there. But those are quite impressive. There's another place called the, uh, between Oyate Tambo and the in Kiryu, a place called Nuapa Inglesia. And uh, again, you can look up one of Brian's tours about that. He calls it some stones of Atlantis or something like that. It was originally a be beautiful carving that some idiots dynamited, blew it in two, looking for treasure. But it's a uh, really hard stone. I forget if andesite, balsamic, some kind of stone there. But it's, it's very, very smooth, jewel-like, very, very smooth. And it obviously did have some kind of a ritual significance because there were seats in it, carvings of things. And across from it, then there's a stone wall. It's got a double door carved into it. And the people call it, are calling it a stargate and the portals. I, I don't like the idea of bringing in things like portals and stargates and things like that. They make, they're make they fun for stories and fun to watch on television. And we have absolutely no evidence of anything like that ever existed anywhere in the world, and certainly not in Peru like that. We don't know what people were thinking in that culture. We don't know what their important things were. We don't know why they did what they did. That's why, to me, when you take a, a carving like Kirumiak, I can do that. It, it was amenable to analysis, at least. And it was logical, amenable, and repeatable. It makes sense. Now, there might be a lot more meaning to it than I've described, but I've just talked about the physical aspects of it. To me, it's pretty impressive that you can tell when the year starts, when the different seasons begin and end. For an agricultural society, which most of the world was up until actually 1800s in our own country, agriculture was the most important thing that there was because you died otherwise. So it was important to know when the season started, when you needed to plant, when you needed to harvest, and maybe a few other ritual days that just for the hell of it, party time. I don't want to put mind-ending meanings to things. In other words, one guy said, obviously, <laughs> just the other day online, oh, it happened to be an amphitheater. Or people gathered. Well, uh, yeah, eight feet across. I don't think so. Eight feet across, eight feet high. You can't even touch it. You know, you have, as you'll know, Facebook, internet, Twitter, are, they're full of experts. I'm sure you've run into it. You could come up with something you totally made up yourself, put it up there. It's a total hoax. And pretty soon there'll be books about it and certainly YouTube stories about it and experts coming on with PhDs and other things telling you about it. One little anecdotal story here. A friend of mine is involved in the precision, studying the precision of ancient carvings in Egypt. And some of these things are good down to a ten thousandth of an inch. I mean, they're, they were done with something different than anybody describes to the ancient Egyptians. So there was a history professor that came up on a certain channel saying that my friend was a liar and a cheat and forger and everything else. And so I asked my friend, are you going to get back on YouTube and challenge him? He says, no, I'm not going to give him that satisfaction. He says, all I know is I had, I had 25 years of high precision engineering that I turned out pieces for aerospace down to the 10,000th of an inch. I had hundreds of meetings with customers in which we were discussing these things. And I cannot recall any one time that we ever asked for the opinion of a history professor about these things we were making. So in other words, this history professor had no background in, in making anything or anything precision, but he was making profound statements about things. And he said, well, amazing, 25 years, hundreds of meetings. We never had to ask the professor of history his opinion about what we were doing. This is one of the things that was my problem. I've said this on a French movie that they made years ago, Revelations of the Pyramids. I think professional archaeology needs to get the opinions of engineers, technicians, artists, sculptors, uh, and even other faces. Because I respect archaeologists. Somebody who will spend in decades of their life studying the uh, syntax of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Does this comma go here? Does that bird point in this direction or that? I respect them for that. They've added immense value to, uh, to knowledge. But once they get outside of that, once they get outside of that, start how to make things, how to produce things, how to measure things, that's outside what they call their swim lane. They have no credentials in that area, nothing to say about it. Now, in my area, about Kiaromiak, 
I admit, I'm the first to admit, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not trained in it at all, but I am an engineer. That's why I went at it from an engineering standpoint. You can criticize everything else about me, but go and look at the shadows. I'll tell you where they're going to be. You can't argue with that. And that's an engineering statement. It's not a uh, statement about Indian cultures or the Incas or Peru or anything. It is what it is. It's a concrete statement or a limestone statement. You can call it that way. I'm outside my swim lane, but my swim lane is measurement, manufacturing, precision. And I, I call it the shadow machine because it is a machine I define as something that you have a certain input into it and it always produces a product. It's a machine doesn't have any judgment value. It, you tell it what to do, you program it, and it does that time after time after time after time repeatable. And, uh, and that's the beautiful thing about this. Key Remyok, it resets the calendar every year. At the end of the year, there's that four-day solar standstill, solar noon for four days in June 21st to the 25th. The sun moves very little. It's at a standstill up there, and then it starts going the other direction. But during those four days down in Peru now, they still have, they call it Inti Rami, the celebration of the sun. Inti is the sun. Inti Rami. There's four days of celebration, 24-7. Let me tell you, the last time we, we were there, <laughs> there were parades. There was noise. There was drinking. There was costumes. And it was great. It was a, it was a four-day party. And every little village you went through in Peru during that time, Time, something was going on. There was a parade. We got all kind of pictures. Sat there at balcony in Cusco and watched the parades come by. Drank a lot of beer. It was it's wonderful. And they're celebrating things, and, and I want to add to that celebration. There's even more to what they're celebrating than they know about. And I want to tell them that, hey guys, not only did your ancestors do the stuff you're talking about, but they got something right here that nobody else in the world's ever done. And uh, that's the way I look at it. It was fun, and I, I want it to be well known. Selfish as I am, I would like to get credit for this discovery. Of course, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't mind selling a few books, but that's the important thing is to get it recognized by professionals, get it logged into the knowledge of the world. This is just one more place. It's not the most important place in the world, but it is important. And the people there need to be proud of their ancestry. That's the entire story, as far as I'm concerned. What message, Arlen, did you employ that led you to solving the ancient Andes mystery of the shadow machine? I took a few measurements the day I was there, and I had Brian Forster to go back and make hundreds of other measurements. He measured distances, dimensions, and angles, and took photographs at different times. I used that. I used a first off, I used a very simple model computer. Uh, CAD model uh, modeling software called TurboCAD. I went into a thing called SketchUp. And SketchUp allows, they usually typically use it for landscaping and buildings and offices and things. And then with SketchUp, you can call in the time of day, have the sun show up at where it's going to be at that time of day, any any day back for hundreds of years. And then when I use the uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration has a page. NOAA has a solar calendar. NOAA tells you where the sun was, the sunrise and sunset every day and where it was in the sky at any coordinate system on Earth any day back for 2,000 years. Between SketchUp and its time of day, showing where the sun was, and coordinating it with that NOAA calendar, I was able to come up with uh, exactly what the shadows are going to be any time of the day. And uh, that's why I used to use these CAD models. That was a lot simpler for me to have than try to make the physical model I intended to do to start with. I, I know people who do 3D printing. I thought, well, if I gave them all this CAD dimensions, they can make a 3D model of it for me, print it out, and we can have a little model to play with. I thought, well, why not have the real thing? Why not have the full-size thing, which I can I draw up in CAD? It was interesting. I learned more about CAD modeling than I had known. Again, that's an engineering thing that is in my field. And so nothing I've done here is outside of, of, of engineering. Kea Rumiak is one of the least known and visited Inca archaeological sites, especially when compared to uh, Machu Picchu. I would think that after reading your book, there will be a significant increase in tourist traffic to the site. Do you have any advice for those planning to visit it? Uh, I understand that Peru now has restrictions on how many cameras you can bring and how many uh, recording devices you can take. And you can't do what I did. You can't climb up on it. First off, it's dangerous. And secondly, it's illegal. Also, <laughs> in 2012, we went there. There was just a crude sign on the highway. We drove back about a mile, got to the site. The road was very, very rough and very poorly maintained. And we walked up there and did our thing for half a day. So got back in 2017 to go look at it. And they had a great big, beautiful sign in the highway. Wonderful site. Drove up there, and now there's a visitor center and a gate, and you have to pay to get in. Trivial amount, probably 25 cents U.S. But the visitor center didn't have much in it. I said, well, at least now, and it had restrooms and stuff. I said, good, get past the gate. Now, surely they'll pay the road all the way up. Uh, the road was in worse condition, so we had to get out and tread, trudge a quarter of a mile 
to get to it. Uh, you have to be careful because if you're there, and sometimes it's wet, the stone steps have no handrail to get up to the place. And so you have to be careful. And I was last time I was there, I was toting 30 pounds of crud on my back, cameras and uh, cameras and video recorders and all kinds of tools and everything else. There is a back way around. We came back around the back way of it to walk back down so we didn't have to go through the steps. And then as I was walking there next to my brother, the ground gave way beneath me. And I started falling down this hillside, and I realized if I go down to 20 feet, I'm going to fall off a darn cliff. So I got my legs going <laughs> to keep up with my body and got myself stopped. But you just have to be careful. There are no handrails, typically in Peru, OSHA, and um, tourist places in the United States would go crazy down there because while we were there in 2012, we were staying in this one little town, getting ready to go up to Machu Picchu the next day. I got out that morning and uh, I asked Brian, where's, where's my son Sean? He said, oh, he... He ran up that way. Sean came down later. I said, what's going on? He said, Dad, a, a woman just got killed up there. Him being a doctor, he ran up there. He had, Somebody said a woman had fallen. He went up there. She had fallen off, off for some 50 foot. There was some kind of uh, habitation, some kind of thing up on the side of the hill. And she climbed up on it and fell off. When he got there, he said, I looked at her. I knew she was dying. She, He, he described what she looked like. I won't say it here, but he said, I told people, leave her alone, get a stretcher. But they picked her up in a blanket and carried her down. But he said, I know she wasn't going to make it. They don't have safety things in there like we do. I guess they expect people to be more grown up and more mature and watch out for yourself. It happened to, you, to a friend of mine. He, he was there with a woman and she kept backing up on top of one of these temples at Hathor and backed off 80 feet up, killed her. Fortunately, I never experienced any of that, but uh, you have to be careful. If you go to Peru, the elevation there at, at Cusco is like 12,000 feet. And so the first thing that I did the second time we went straight to a store and bought little bottles of oxygen to carry in case you start to feel woozy or passing out or something, sniff on oxygen. When you go to Machu Picchu, it's actually a couple thousand feet lower. But you should probably stay around Cusco the first day. Uh, go to the sites out there, Soxway Mon, Kinko, a few other little places around there you can see. Spend there a couple of days until your body gets used to it. Unless you're coming down from Mount Colorado or somewhere, you know. But any other place, you probably get used to the altitude first. I made a mistake. The first time I was there, we pushed it too far, too fast. And I slipped and fell at Saxway Mon and hit my knee real hard. And that caused problems. A couple months later, my sciatic nerves and stuff. The second time we went, we took it easy. A couple of days couple of days sightseeing tours and go around and look at things, museums, stay level. Also, be sure you're with a group or with other people and don't go anywhere at night alone. The State Department has issued uh, safety warnings. Well, you can look them up online. Just look at State Department warnings for Peru. And uh, it was a beautiful place. I, mean, the, the, I think the people were wonderful. The guides we had, uh, each time we had a Peruvian guide driving and the uh, I didn't feel anything like you're trying to be ripped off or endangered or anything. It was it was great. But just don't be alone because you, you never know. Okay. <laughs> I could say that about 20 different U.S. cities too right now. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy Kiarumi Yak, Lost Secrets of the Shadow Machine? How can they do that? Look me up on Amazon.com. I think it's on BarnesandNoble.com too. If you look up Kia Romeoc, I think there's only one author that's shown under that right now. But uh, Amazon.com. I would like more people to read about it. Dr. Arlen Andrews Sr., I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. Yakking with you has been most informative. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stan. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. To be sure you're amongst the first to receive new interviews when they're released and to have access to previous ones, subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, all you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen.